Because of Mr. Corrupt by Rob Boyer. Continuing part two, page 159. We're still in March. Danielle, you're young, just like my brother I wanted to say to Anna's mother, but I didn't want to be disrespectful, so I didn't say anything and she stood staring at the door of Charlie. I could tell Anna was playing matchmaker again, but I didn't want to say anything about that either. My family would never want to see Charlie and Tether together. Never. I also met Jessica's mom. She was very nice. You can call me Julie or Mrs. Reitman. Whatever you're more comfortable saying, she said. Anna's house was simple but nice. I guess you didn't need a big old house when it was only you and your mom. The thing I liked best about Anna's place was the artwork hanging on some of the walls. I took a closer look at one of the sketches and read the name Terry Adams at the bottom. Anna's mother was an artist? I looked down at the sketch I held in my hands, the one that came from my bedroom wall. I had brought it to leave in Mr. Shrub's room. Mrs. Adams must have noticed me looking at her work and my work. Is that one of your sketches? she asked. Anna has told me you're a beautiful artist. I held a drawing out for her to see, but I didn't say anything. Well, I'd say Anna was right. That was a lovely piece, Danielle. Thank you, ma'am, I said. You've done some wonderful things with shadowing and texture. She pointed to different areas of my sketch. I'm not sure what that means, ma'am, but thank you. Next time you come over, I'd be happy to do some sketching with you, she said, and I'll give you a few pointers if you'd like. Next time I come over, she had said. Anna and Jessica and her mom joined us. Told you she was an amazing sketch artist, Anna said to her mom. Ms. Adams smiled at us. Come on, Danielle. I'll show you some of mom's other drawings and my bedroom. I followed Anna, but not before I returned Mrs. Adams' smile. I wondered what could possibly be the bad influence in Anna's house. I liked it here, and I liked the two people who lived here. I also knew Grandma wouldn't be as easily convinced. After hanging out in Anna's bedroom, it was time to go. On the car ride, the three of us sat in the back seat. Jessica held her book, Anna held her plant, and I held my special sketch. We were all quiet. I stared out the window at the passing snowbanks and tried to keep from thinking about the snowball day, but that was impossible. For the rest of my life, I knew that snow would trigger my memory of the accident. Jessica, Act 9, Scene 2. Characters, me, me. Julie, my mother. Danielle, my friend. Anna, my friend. Terry, Anna's mother. Action. The elevator doors opened. We stepped into the white hall. I thought of my first day at school when my heart had thumped in my chest. The smell of disinfectant had lingered in the hallway. The smell of rubbing alcohol and iodine dominated this hospital hallway. Instead of the chatter of school kids arriving after a summer vacation, the only thing I could hear was the incessant beeping of those scary machines. This was way worse than the first day of school. I swallowed. I gripped and squeezed and fidgeted with the book in my hands. Al Capone does my shirts. On that first day, Mr. Drupp had told me he liked happy endings, so I brought him this book. I knew he wouldn't be able to see or read it, but I wanted him to have it. Plus, having something in my hands helped me with my nerves. I'm glad his door wasn't too far away. Otherwise, I might not have made it, but I did. And so did Danielle and Anna. We were there for each other. We stopped just outside his door. The black marker spelled out to Rupp. I rubbed my finger on it. It didn't smear. I looked at Danielle and Anna. There was no hiding our fear. My mother and Terry stood behind us for support, but they also let us do this on our own. I looked back at them. We're right here, Mom said. We'll come in with you, Terry added. I took a deep breath and readied myself for what I would see. Anna, how you doing? Mom asked. I shook my head. The hallway was so sad and frightening and long beeping and coughing and moaning noises came from everywhere. Mom placed her hand on my shoulder. I'm here, she said. How did you know about the dent in Charlie's truck? I whispered. I couldn't stop thinking about it. I'll tell you later. Do you know him? Yes, I know Charlie, Mom said, but I had no idea he had a little sister. We stopped. Mr. Trupp's door was cracked open, but not enough for me to see inside. Suddenly my worries and questions about my mom and Charlie vanished. They were quickly replaced by all my worries for Mr. Terrupt. Was I ready for this? Danielle, Jessica, and I looked at each other and did our best to prepare for what was coming next. 
Danielle. There was no turning back. Dear God, it's Danielle. Please be with me. I'm going to need your help. I guess I could have waited in the car or in the lounge, but being with brave friends kept me moving forward. Beep, beep, cough, cough, hack, 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 moan, moan, groan. The chorus of hospital noises made me cringe. I felt my shoulders pushing into my ears. We walked past an old lady sitting in the hallway. She was shaking and drooling in her wheelchair. I could hear Grandma saying, You better put me in the ground before you send me off to one of them places with all those drooling geezers. For a second, I laughed inside, thinking of that. But just for a second. We stopped. The sign on the door said, Interrupt. The door was partially open, but I couldn't see inside. That's probably a good thing, because I may have run back to the car had I seen what Mr. Trump looked like. The three of us nodded at each other silently. We were ready. Or so we thought. This is when I'll need you most. Jessica, Act 9, Scene 3. Action. Mr. Trupp's door stood slightly ajar, so I slowly pushed it open and stepped into his room. He wasn't alone, but he didn't have a roommate. He had a visitor. Alexia. I stopped. Danielle and Anna saw her too. We all stopped. Alexia was by Mr. Trupp's bed, her back to us. She didn't know we were there. I could hear her talking to him. Like, I've been trying to be nice, Teach. I've been quiet. I don't know, like, what else to do? I haven't been mean. You'd be happy about that, Teach. I've been doing it your way. But, like, I still need your help. I need you to come back. Everyone needs you back. I stood right beside Alexia now. But she remained unaware. She buried her face in Mr. Trupp's bed and sobbed. I looked at my teacher. He rested peacefully in his white bed sheets among tubes going in and out of his body, and screens with green numbers and lines on them and beeping noises. I felt him telling me what to do. I reached out and placed my hand on Alexia's back. She lifted her head and looked at me through her tear-filled eyes. I started crying then, too. Alexia stood up and we hugged, a big hug. I'm so sorry, she said. I felt her squeeze me tight. Me too, I said. I've never been to California, she blubbered. My mom threw my dad out of the house last year. He never got sick. Alexia sobbed into my shoulder. I squeezed her tight now. She choked tears, I said. My dad's not around either. He's still in California with his girlfriend. We held the hug, not with lazy arms, but strong arms. We squeezed all our sorries out in that hug. When we let go, Alexia hugged Danielle and Anna just the same. Tears filled all our eyes now, even my mom's and Terry's. We sat in the chairs next to Mr. Trout's bed. We sat on both sides and said nothing. I placed my book on the stand next to his bed. Anna put her plant by the window, and Danielle tacked her sketch to a wall. We thought our own thoughts and stared at our teacher, who lay motionless with his eyes closed. Yet somehow I felt better. The power of Mr. Trout, even in his coma, made something huge transpire. I felt light, like I could float. The past had been buried, and we were ready to move forward. When it came time to leave, I touched Mr. Trump's hand and whispered, Thank you. Then I walked out with my three friends.